Okay, welcome back, folks, to uh, week two of Renman University, uh, which seems strange since I never graduated from a university. Maybe I can get a degree this way. Anyway, I want to thank you all for coming back. If it's your first time, let me welcome you. If you're back for the second time, I hope you did your homework last week. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about this idea of getting your head in the right place to do something great in the music business. Uh, this music business is not easy. It's wacky. It's crazy. We love it. But if you're going to be successful, I'm convinced of one thing. You need to get your head screwed on tight. So today, what I'm going to do is share with you some of these big picture ideas that I have learned the hard way over the last 36 years. Uh, these weren't lessons I read in a book or you know, saw in a YouTube video. These are things you could have only learned by actually being out there doing it. And, uh, and so I'm going to share those thoughts with you today in the hopes that it can help give you a bigger and better idea of what you're up against and how you can deal with all the stuff that comes with this business. Um, along the way today... I'm going to you know, introduce you to some of the people that have been a part of our Renman Live web program. And we've been very lucky to have had uh, some of the smartest, most talented, most experienced uh, and sharing people in the music business come on our website, on our web show called Renman Live, and talk about the music business. Publishers, uh, record company people, promoters, managers, agents, all kinds of folks. And I invite you guys to go on our website at renmanmb.com. Can we show that real quick, Dee? Um, changing it right up out of the box here. Uh, it's a great resource for you. It's a place where you can plug in with all those folks here. Here's a list of all of our guests. Uh, it's www.renmanmb.com. If you haven't already found it, you should spend some time there, uh, all kinds of valuable information along the way. Um, speaking of getting started, most of you folks, a couple of you guys I've known a while, and I know a couple of you are just kind of getting started in the business. Maybe not day one, but still learning because you're here today. Um, I don't know about most of you folks out there, but when I was a kid growing up, there wasn't YouTube videos. There was only one way to read about people that had done something successful, and that was to read books. So uh, I never read a lot of you know, classic literature. I was you know, reading incessantly books of people that I admired who'd succeeded, right? Um, today, uh, we have this whole YouTube thing where you can actually show people and have them tell their own story. So um, out of all those smart, talented people that we've had on the show, um, all of them had a story of how they got started in the business. And, and I think that's the short version of all those books I read. So I'm going to introduce you to some of these folks that have been on the show and give you their getting started stories over the course of the next 10, 11 weeks in the hopes that it might inspire you to, to, to get your own story going and to show you that as many people as there are, as is, is many different attitudes and different looks as the business there are, uh, all of them have their own getting started story. And I hope that one day we'll be Lucky enough, I'll be interviewing you and asking you or, or asking you to recall your story. So anyway, uh, to help me today, if you're going to do something big, you need some help. And uh, we'd love to have a conversation going. And so to help facilitate that, we have with us the lovely, the talented, and effervescent, and beautiful, so too, uh, Ms. Joel Wrightson, who is an artist in her own right. She's going to be presiding over the chat room. Yes. encouraging you folks to ask questions, to be involved, and to be engaged. We've got a little saying around the camp here, don't we, Michelle? Yes, Would we do. Would you like to share that with our students today? I'd love to. You don't ask, you don't get, and oh. you don't learn. And you don't learn. You've got to be a little bit stronger on the you don't learn part. I'll hang on. You don't learn anything, <laughs> folks. If you came here to learn something you to and you're sitting in the back of the class, you're not lucky like these four guys to actually be in the room. I hope you'll ask questions. You can do it on the chat room. And maybe next time we'll put up our hotline. And if you're feeling really dangerous, you can call in. Um, I also want to take a moment to introduce this handsome bunch that's with us today. Four aspiring music professionals and or musicians. I'm not sure, but I'll go and ask them to introduce themselves. A couple of them I know, but I'll start with this gentleman over here on the right. You are? My name is uh, Sam Scares. And you are an aspiring professional, a musician, or a music lover I am only? First and foremost, a music lover, but uh -huh. then a uh, professional and a manager in the industry. Great. That is the correct answer. Okay, thank you. Good to have you here again, Sam. Sam's a guy I've spent a little bit of time with. He's been a big active member of our website and who I'm, uh, I'm convinced will do some great things in this business. To his right, my left, another gentleman who we've hung out with before, who's back again, who keeps showing up. Introduce yourself. Please. My name's Vic Hightan. And you are? I'm a musician artist. 
from St. Louis, Missouri. Yes. All right, great. To your right, my left. I'm Andrew Brochetti. Where am I looking? You're looking at me. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> They're gonna like, get we, We're doing all the driving. You just gotta show up. Cool. Man, okay? I like it. Th- I like it that way. I'm Andrew Brochetti. Um, I'm an aspiring A and R from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Another but I live Pennsylvania. In LA now. Okay. Yeah. How long have you lived out here in L.A.? Uh, since June. After I graduated college, I moved out here. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, they just keep coming uh, west. I okay? know. You haven't been through your first earthquake yet, have you? I haven't. I All haven't. right, well, then you're not totally I've, committed I've seen yet. rain twice, too. <laughs> yeah, I bet you it's not 80 degrees in Pittsburgh today. Yeah, it's like 10. Yeah, okay. you know, speaking of, uh, and, of of earthquakes, first earthquake was ever on a uh, on a bus about two summers ago. So Here in L.A.? Yeah, a little, little unofficial, but, you Let know. Let me tell you something. Anybody who lives in Calvary, you haven't been through an earthquake yet, okay? <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, why don't you tell us who you are? Yeah, my name is uh, Alex Jeffers. I'm from, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and um, I'm an aspiring um, music business professional, trying to uh, tap into each each part of the market. Okay, so we have no musicians here today. Right. Oh, sorry, Victor. I'm <laughs> right sorry. Here. See, I consider him just a man about town. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, so we'll talk about all this stuff, but it's interesting to have some music professionals here with us today. Um, so we also want to welcome our folks online here today who are watching the show. We got some folks online. Did anybody show up today, Michelle? Got a lot of folks online today. Any, 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 where are they from? Anything exotic, some, fun? We got some Brazil, Liverpool. Brazil? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Love Brazil. Mm-hmm. UK, uh-huh. Liverpool. We got some East Coast, Jersey, Pennsylvania. In Liverpool right now, it's 1 it? o'clock in the morning. Yeah, he said he's okay. breathing it out. I'm pretty sure that's right, That's beer commitment. Yet. Okay, put down those beers, man. I don't want you falling asleep here. Okay. Ooh, we got in Mexico, too. And we got Mexico. Viva Mexico. Buenos dias, mis amigos in Medico. Okay, <laughs> great bunch down there. Uh, okay, now for your folks that are online, I know you're out there, but we're in the chat room. Everything working in the chat room today? Great. Excellent. Um, so to make sure you're paying attention and to make sure you're being engaged and we're encouraging you to, to be involved, we're going to use the modern technology of Ustream and ask you a little poll question right out of the box. So my question to all you folks online is, is this your first time to Ren Man U or were you here last week and this week? And uh, Joe's going to take the poll over there and give us some results in a minute, but please weigh in or I'll find you and kick you out of here. Okay, um, talking about the big picture today, right? And uh, today we're not going to be talking about the details of making music or putting on concerts or making records or finding artists and any of that stuff, which may seem strange for people that are still trying to figure out the music business. <clears throat> it's not strange for somebody that's been doing it for a long time, because what you find if by doing it is that this is a wacky business. Things don't always make sense. Oftentimes they make no sense at all, and people are left with it, particularly the professionals and the musicians, to try to sort it out. So one of the things I've learned is that you have to get your head in the right place. You have to have a healthy, realistic look at the attitude in the big picture of what's going on here, right? And the reason it's so important is this. You guys have probably been doing this long enough to know that there are so many things that are out of your control in the music business that it would scare most reasonable people right out of the room, right? And, and, and it's real, and it's ongoing, and it never, ever goes away. So if you're going to try to survive in the business, if you guys, how long have you guys been doing this? About Alex? Two years now. Six Andrew, months. six months? Well, like eight years. Okay, eight years in, in Sammy? About eight or ten. Okay, none of you been doing it. Together, you guys don't equal half of the 36 years I've been doing this, right? And I had some wise guy, you know, put a note on a YouTube channel about, oh, this guy's just been lucky. To that loser out there, I'll tell you, you can get lucky for 36 seconds, you get lucky for 36 minutes, or 36 days, or 36 months. You don't get lucky for 36 years. One of the reasons I've lasted in this business is because I look at it very realistic, and I have a handle uh, about this idea of the big picture. And the reason it's so important is because the only thing that you can control, or one of the very few things you control, is the attitude that you bring to the game every day. So if you're one of these people that just bitch and moan about how tough it is, that will show up somewhere. If you're one of these people that shirks responsibility and wants to get in the limelight when it's a great idea and be out of the room when it's not a great idea, you won't succeed in this business for long. Maybe for 36 seconds, maybe for 36 minutes, but not for 36 years. Once the bullets start flying in this war of the music business, it's happening so fast that you don't have time 
to think about everything that's going on. So there needs to be this instinctive edge about what's going on. You would have had to sort through the big picture of these filters, you know? Certain things where they're just coming in, it's like the battlefield surgeon who walks down amongst the wounded and he's not grieving the ones that are dying, he's just trying to identify the ones that could live. And, and, it's, and in that moment, it's, that's the way you gotta think about the music business. So being instinctive is important. Like I said, you need to have sorted out all this stuff before you get into the battle or you'll freak out. Um, and so when all is said and done, you have to trust your big picture calls because they're gonna guide all the day-to-day -day decisions that you make in this business. Do I do this? Do I do that? Should I be trust this person? Should I not trust this person? And so forth and so on. So there's about a dozen big picture concepts that we did some videos for when we first started this website. And again, if you go to our website and you're on the, you're on, are you guys on the front page, Joe? If you go to our home page, uh, and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see in the feed, there's, a, there's a, a link to the big picture. And those are the videos that we started this website with. And they were all ideas about getting your head in the right place. And we're gonna talk about some of those today. And there's about 12 of them, but there's, two or, there's a couple that are actually fundamental to my whole mentality about the business. And we're gonna start with number one, and it's this idea of dream it and then do it, okay? Um, I haven't met many people, really, that, are, that aren't dreaming about doing something big in the business. Alex, what are you dreaming of doing in the business? Uh, ultimately, um, my whole you know, plan of going into it was uh, to travel the world, so you know, I want to take advantage. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my whole you know, uh, reasoning behind it was initially, you know, I, I want to be a traveler, so I want to you know, see different parts of the mm -hmm. world, you know, as do uh, you know, thousands of other people. And mm -hmm. I figured you know, what would be the most effective way that I could do it, and you know, I figured if I could link up with you know, the right bands and the right people, you know, I could, I could make well, that. Well, you could have joined the Army. It would have been a steadier pay. Yeah, I right? could have, but I wouldn't have been happy, you know? Okay. I mean, in the music business, you get you know, emotionally wounded. Nobody actually shoots at But you. then when you come out on top, I guess that makes it all worth it, right? You know what? You, you got to love the ride, and I always yeah. love the ride more when you get to slam that football in the end zone. Okay? I've, I've definitely learned, learned that you learn most from the bad experiences rather than you do from the I say it all the time. The you got to love the ride. Exactly. Okay, because it's going to go up and down. Andrew. I, my main goal is I just want to help deserving artists succeed. Mm -hmm. And I knew I, I wasn't meant to work a nine to five. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just, I can't imagine myself doing anything. So you're not in it for Andrew Bacchetti? No, I'm not in it for me. So I you're kind of like the mother Teresa of A&R. Exactly. I'm just winding I'm, I'm up the, a little bit. I'm the nice guy of A&Rs. Okay. But, but you know, realistically about it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But you so, want to be successful at it. Of course. I want to find a great artist and I want to help them succeed in any and you're okay possible. with getting a win out of that yourself too. And I, if I win too, we all. I mean, Excellent. hey, their win is my win. My win's their win. That's all how right. I look at all it. All right, good, good, uh, Victor. I, for the folks that didn't watch, that, how many all folks, right. by the way, Joe? Just to interrupt for that. How many of the folks are, are new? Ten percent. Ten percent are new. Okay, so we got some recurring customers. We need to do some work on getting some new folks. Okay, Victor. Um, I like to get a recording contract with the one of the major labels. So okay. they can help uh, support my ideas I got and okay. go from there. And Sammy? Uh, to be honest with you, I just like having the freedom to be able to okay. do what I like to do. All right, cool. Um, all right, well, you know what? So these are some of the dreams you guys are talking about. So we're all talking to the dreamer in all of us, right? You know, and, and for most people that are just dreaming, okay, my goal has always been, even if it's a band or anybody that's talking to me that's interested in the business, it's to get them to be a doer because the dreaming part um, is easy. What are, what are the folks online dreaming about yeah. here today, Michelle? Uh, we got Ja D. Fire. I'm going to win Best New Artist at the 2017 Grammys. All right. All right. So he's like warming up three thinks. years. Okay. Me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Good. Who else? <laughs> we got uh, Avenger stuff. Dream. Be worthy and playing the kind of venues slash shows that we want to. Red Rocks, Madison Square Garden. Okay. Now we're talking yeah. some little detail. Yeah, All yeah, right. yeah. We got Stereo George to expand my years of experience in the music industry as a tour manager to become a wonderful manager to artists. Okay, a wonderful manager. I love those things. It's kind of that kind of dreamy view of it all. Okay, well, you'll I'll squeeze a little bit of that out of you. All right. Well, you know what? Good to see everybody dreaming. Because yeah. if you're looking to do something big in the music biz, I think you're in the right place. You know, because at the end of the day. 
I think you need to have a dream that'll get you out of bed in the morning, right? That, that where you go to bed at night, and you're not dreading getting up in the morning. You're actually getting to bed early like me because I want to get up early and get after it, right? It, if you can find a dream, something you're passionate about, and you're lucky enough to turn that into a living, right? They, I can't think of anything better. And for me, I've been able to do that. And I sometimes feel like the luckiest man in the world. But being able to take your passion and do it for a living is, is really, really difficult to do, no matter what business you're in. It's particularly true here. Um, but it's worth the effort, as one of you said. When you get a chance to do it and you defy the odds, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievably gratifying, right? Um, if you're dreaming, though, for some of the folks that might have just watched here for the first time today, I got to say it, this whole idea of dreaming is freaking easy, right? There's no risk. The endings are perfect. You know, it requires no work. Nobody who ever woke up in the middle of the night sweating from, you know, having a date with Cindy Crawford. Maybe they did, but if they did, they you know, shouldn't have worried about it. So this idea of dreaming is easy because it always works out here. It's the doing part. That's the tough part. That's the doing part that puts the, the miles on your tires and you know, wears out you know, your psyche sometimes. And you know, because it invites these ugly things into the mix. Failure, right? Any of you guys worried about failing in the music business? I mean, honestly? I mean, yeah, because I know it's going to happen, but. I mean, uh, failure's going to happen, so I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. <laughs> But right. I mean, you love winning more than losing? Oh, fuck yeah. Okay, well, that's, okay, that's a great start, Andrew. I mean, everyone, I think everyone fears failure at, to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but in, the, in my, the pit of my mind, I know that it's going to happen. I feel like you have to, in somewhere in your mind, know it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to hit some bumps, mm -hmm. but like you said, like when you come out at the end, that's what makes it all worth okay, it. Yeah, that's a healthy attitude. Victor, we talked about it. I know you're, yeah. yeah. Mistakes happen, you know, but... I made tons of them, but uh, it makes me stronger. I keep going, you know, it's mo motivation. Yeah, they're, 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 some of the best lessons are from failure. Winning sometimes clouds your judgment and, and gives you a sense of value that you may not deserve. And sometimes losing can make you feel stupider or, 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 or less great at what you are. Sammy? Yeah, I mean, failure, at, by this point in my career, I've ex experienced quite a bit of failure. Okay. So it's just, it's, I don't like to spend enough a lot of time Mm -hmm. dwelling on it otherwise yeah. someone else is getting what I could be getting it's you know it, it's part of the process is, is doing it any of you guys ever get editorial from your friends going Jesus you guys are out of your mind you got no chance what are you thinking about Andrew because you would be an A&R guy what are you out of your mind anybody ever say that to you absolutely okay parents getting in your helmet there they don't even uh, they don't even get it <laughs> okay sure they'll get it if they're seeing you get an award one day right that's what I told um, my mom. the bottom line is that oh, the, the music business like my other great passion, golf, right, has this wonderful ability to mine some of the worst instincts in humanity right out of you. Fear, insecurity, and paranoia. I joke about it. We call it the FIP factor here in the office. What's the FIP factor? They go, what? And I say, fear, insecurity, and paranoia. We all got it. Some people worse than others. Some people can mask it. Some people can work through it better than us. But we all have it, right? Um, insecurity, do you ever wonder do I have what it takes? Honestly? Okay, because if he's told me no, I'm going to say you're bullshitting because if you're not, then you're not really even conscious. But insecurity is part of it. You know, do I have what it takes? Am I just a lucky guy? Believe it or not, for 36 years, every year at the end of December, my wife wants to leave town because he goes, oh, God, he's going to go through his December thing of like, oh, God, am I going to be able to do it again? Is this going to last another moment? And people say, how can that be? You've been successful because it's part of it's part of achieving is that you could lose and thinking about it is not something unusual. Any of you guys ever battle with moments of paranoia where all of a sudden you made a decision, it's not quite working out, and now you start to wonder, did this guy sandbag you? Did this person, you know, get you off track and have something? Does that ever enter your equation? Mm -hmm. People don't call you back and now you're going, oh my God, this is what's going on, my God, right? No? You're wondering yeah. what they think of you because, you know, maybe they haven't responded. Yeah, right yeah. And the, and the truth of the matter is, folks, not to scare you, but to have a real conversation about the music biz, you have every reason in the world to be nervous, insecure, fearful, and, and try to steer away from the paranoia, but it's out there because this business really is freaking tough, okay? It's, there's lots of businesses that are tough, 
But in the music business, things don't have to make sense. If we're building Fords, we screw the tires on, we do this, we do that, we might have the odd recall, but there's an assembly line, do all these pieces, you have a car, right? There is no recipe in the music business. There is no right or wrong answer. And, and beware the person that tells you, I know, because I know changes minute to minute. Something that works today could be not working tomorrow. And, you, and it, wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be worthy of you wasting your time about why it didn't happen today. It's about figuring out, is it, what can I do tomorrow, right? So you guys are smart guys. You figured out the chances of succeeding in the music business, if you're looking at it from a statistical odds point of view, you, you, know, you give you the over-under on you guys make it in the music. But I'm going to take the under, nothing personal, but because the odds are so overwhelmingly stacked against you. You saw this thing about Warren Buffett's going to offer a billion dollars. If you can predict the outcome of every single game in the NCAA tournament, right? Now, and, he's, and by the way, this guy's pretty good at math. I think we'd all agree. If you don't know who Warren Buffett is, read the paper, right? One of the smartest guys on the planet. So he's done the arithmetic, and he's probably figured out that's a pretty safe bet. But just in case I have to pay off, okay, that's $1 billion out of 80 no big deal, right? So the odds are that most reasonable people would be heading for the exits right about now. I'll wait. Anybody heading for the exits? No. You guys aren't going anywhere. So it begs the question of why would reasonable, smart people do this? Right? People ask me, why do you do this, Steve? And here's, I'm going to tell you a little story. Right? I had some mentors early in my career. There was a guy by the name of Bob Geddes who was one of my mentors. And he was this tough guy. He was a former NFL football player. And he was so much a supporter of mine. But when I say this guy was a tough guy, I mean, he, he, would, he just reduced me to freaking rubber legs 20 times when I came walking in. Big, tough guy. And he sent me out going, oh, my God. Right? But he had a great... He had these great tidbits of advice that he shared with me that still stay in my head. And one of them was this bit of advice. You know, I came in with some wacky idea about something. Oh, we should be doing this. He goes, let me tell you something, Randy. In life, it's my experience that there are a million things that whisper at you, that want your attention, that they're whispering for you. He said, it's my experience that only a precious few things actually scream for your attention. And me, Steve Rennie, I don't pay any attention to the whispers. I only listen for the screams, right? And the point I'm making is this. If this music business is an itch that has to be scratched, if it's not a whispering, clearly a scream, unlike some of the people in the business that will paint the dark picture and how tough it is, my friend Bob Les, that's a great guy, but who talks about how tough it is. Um, I'm gonna say, if you understand everything you're getting into, you guys are all young guys, I say take the shot. Take the shot, see if you got it, because even if you quote unquote fail, the lessons you learn, the lessons you learn about character and about doing and accepting risk are going to serve you well in some other part of your life that you may not even be thinking about today. So um, that said, if you're dreaming about the business, you've decided to do, right? That's not enough, okay? That's, you know, I want it to happen. Oh, I'm really into it. That's not enough. You're going to need a plan. You're going to need to dedicate yourself to the music. That means it becomes all-consuming. Sammy, you felt that all-consuming? Band guys calling you and you kicking ass for them, doing everything. They call you up and say, hey, we don't want you to be a manager anymore, right? Did that turn you away? Here you are again today, right? It happens to everybody, right? Everybody that's managed a band, managed a ball club, managed a basketball team, managed a company, know in their heart of hearts, one day they're getting the call, right? So, you know, you have to dedicate yourself to it, and it has to be bigger than the clients that you're working with, bigger than any of those people you want to take care of for. you got to be doing it for you, Andrew Brichetti. That's why I want to bring all that Mother Teresa shit out of you, man. You can say, hey, man, I'm going to help you, but I want to win, too. And the reason I say that to you is because if you're sitting with some artist that doesn't have the same ambition, that doesn't have the same burning desire to succeed, he's holding you back because you can't make him smarter than they want to be. Trust me, I know, okay? If you're going to be successful in this business, dreaming's not enough. You need to put together a team. There's nobody in this business that's smart enough to take care of everything. The smart ones understand that, and they recruit a team of people to help them. Is it tough to get that team? Oh, yeah, it's tough, and we're going to talk about it next week, okay? The people that are interested in it, 
they do their homework. When I wanted to be a golfer, I was out practicing every single day. It didn't matter. I quit six times a week, started seven, okay? But I was always at it. I was doing my homework. For the people that are serious, for the people that are watching out there, if you've just turned into the show and you've never gone and looked at any of those 500 videos of the smartest, most talented, sharpest, and most successful people in the business, I'm going to ask you, what are you waiting for? You waiting for somebody to deliver the success to your door? Is that what your game plan is? You're just going to be entitled to it? Entitlement, entitlement doesn't work in the music business, right? I'll tell you something else that I've learned. In the music business, and something I learned in golf, where I, you'll hear the analogy continually over these 10 weeks, and you'll, you'll understand it. you got to have a target. When some kid comes in and says, well, I just want to be in the music. I'll do anything. I said, really? Would you mop my floor? Would you do anything? It's not good enough. You guys have all told me specifically, much more specifically than most, what you want to do, right? You know, I want to travel the world that's a little vague, you know what I mean? Because you're going to need to figure out where you're traveling, who you're traveling with, how you're getting there, how you get. So that idea of getting a target helps focus your efforts, whether you're playing golf or whether you're in the music business. It's, you know, it gives you something to shoot for. Um, if you have a target, right, you have some measure of how you're doing it. So I'm aiming this clicker at that door and I hit the bathroom, right, I miss by a bunch. If I'm just throwing it out there anywhere, I don't know how I'm doing, right? Does that make sense to you guys? Um, so having a target is a key element. I find that the tighter the target is, that's why I press you guys. Give me tighter. What, what does that mean? What do you, I want to help people. What the fuck does that mean, okay? I want to help people. The postman can help people, right? The tighter you can get it, the more likely you are to focus in on the things it takes to accomplish that task. So get tight. Have a target. Lock on it. Because the tighter the, the target is, the easier it is to imagine that outcome in your mind. And it will actually subconsciously lead you, I think, to the right places lots of times. Um, if you're going to succeed in the music business, right? Desire alone is not enough. The, I want to be big is not enough. Um, it takes time and effort to develop a skill set that will allow you to do that. If you want to be a musician, you have to learn how to play an instrument. I'll qualify that somewhat by saying that because of technology today, you can get guys like uh, Derek from the Pretty Lights or Avicii, who are not traditional musicians in the sense that they play guitar, piano, drums, whatever. Cody, one of our guys on the camera over here, is not a traditional musician, but because of technology, they can make sounds and noises and get the drums. They can get John Bonham to play a string section and pull it all together. But you got to have skills to be in the game. You have to be honest about whether your skill set is enough to compete at the level you want to compete at. I'll give you an example. When I was a guy, kid growing up, wanted to play golf. I was practicing every, doing everything I could. I had all the desire in the world. I did my homework. I did all of the stuff that I just described. But at the end of the day, there were 14 year old, 14 year old kids out there that could beat me to a pulp. So for me to expect that my skill set was going to operate at the level I wanted to play on turned out to be unrealistic. And those are these honest conversations you have to have with yourself. Um, if you are serious about getting over in the music business as a professional or as a musician, you are going to need to make a huge commitment of time and energy. It's been my observation that in some ways this generation of, of young people particularly true in America, have grown up around success and they think it's the natural state of affairs when nothing could be further from the truth. That's one of the reasons you see so many foreign students in American universities, because they want a piece of the American dream and they don't feel entitled to it. So they're not talking about their mom and their dad. They're out there trying to make something happen, right? So for them, if they miss a Friday night booze up and they got their homework right, that's the price they pay to be a part of the American dream that we all accept as a given, right? So it takes a huge amount of time and energy. Now, if you're an artist, I'll say that it's, it's a really huge amount of time and energy. Um, I mentioned at the top, I'm going to introduce you to some of these people that have been a part of our show. Really, really smart people. I'm going to introduce you to one right now. It's a gentleman by the name of Bruce Floor. If you've watched our show, you've seen this bit. Go to the bathroom, take a break. Um, 
Bruce Flores, big time A&R guy, big time manager, big time radio promotion guy, had a great story of starting when he was back in college. He had an observation about what it takes to actually compete in this music video. I want to play the clip for the folks out there that are watching today right now. Take it away, D. This rock bands, there's a 10 year gestation period. 10 years between the time they started making music and the time shit's really going off for them. Think about it. I mean, I, I, my morning jacket, modest mouth, death cap for cutie. Incubus. Incubus, right? Ten years. Ten years. Yeah. And and a lot of people get into it, right? Now, let's go. Instant grat. Because mm -hmm. they aren't really willing to die for the craft. They want to mm -hmm. be a rock star. They don't want to live a rock star. And, yeah. th and that's where I see a lot of it is like... Um, a lot of it has to be that no matter what happens, this band or this person's making music, regardless of all the things around it. And ultimately, they will find a level of success if there's talent there. You guys seen that clip before? You have? Yeah, see, I'm playing to the... Uh, for you folks that haven't seen it out there, it's my observation that's true. That seven, eight, ten years, I think about my friends in Incubus, eight years from the time they started the band till they started having success. Uh, it was at least eight years for the Black Keys. We just saw them when they came up for air. Um, Bruno Mars, I know from talking to his A&R guy and talking to his manager, it was at least eight years before he became the, the star that everybody sees out there today that feels brand new, right? Uh, I played golf recently with Nate Roos from, from Fun, who even when he has accepted his award, thought I hardly feel like a new artist because he's been doing it for a very long time. So I ask all of you guys in here, you guys got eight, ten years? Because I'm telling you, it's the same truth for business people. You got eight, <laughs> ten years in you, man? Man, I got my whole fucking life ahead of me, so, yeah. You're in? Yeah. Burkett? I'm in. All eight out. to ten I'm years, in. man. I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. All those people go, what are you doing out there in L.A., man? <clears throat> They'll know. They'll know when I make it. Okay. That's that's what I'll tell them. Victor, I know is in. All, all in. Yeah. And Sammy, he keeps showing I'm up. In. I already know the answer. <laughs> Let me ask you the folks online here, Michelle. Yes. Let's get those folks involved online. You folks out there got eight, ten years in you. You feeling it that much? You feeling that confident? Feel like you can shovel that much stuff? Furian wants to know if he's too old. He's twenty-five. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, you know uh, what? I'm 58. You're, you're a kid. And the, uh, we got a lot of yeps, a lot of yes. We got somebody saying music is timeless. You're never too old. That's okay. Nice. That's, you know, That's well, nice. <laughs> I hope you're right about that. But <laughs> okay. We got one nope. <laughs> we got one nope. <laughs> By on, the way, man. folks, for the person that said nope or no, that's okay. Okay. It's okay because I didn't stop playing golf when I couldn't be a golf pro. In fact, I love it more now than ever because I can do it without the burden of trying to think I have to do this for a living, which ruined it for me, okay? Now as an amateur, I can have it be ruining me for different reasons, but I'm going to play in golf tournaments with young kids, and I always go, hey, you know, I ain't trying to get on the PGA Tour. I'm just doing this for fun. So if I shoot 85 today, I'm going to keep smoking my cigar and I'll buy you guys a beer when we're done. And I'm going to go home and I'm still going to be looking good. So anyway, that's the Bruce Lord thing. I want to talk about to his question right there. It's a great question yeah. and a great segue. This whole idea of how should I start? Am I too old? Am I too this? Am I told that? Too mm -hmm. that, right? Um, when I started this website, I thought I'd be talking to people like you, people in their early you know, 20s that are just are people like Michelle. You got a question? No, I'm saying we have people 54. Somebody said 44. Okay. They have 8 to okay. 10 years. Great. You know, here's what we're going to talk about is this whole idea of, 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 of how long it takes. I believe that 8 to 10 is true. Okay. I started officially in the music business when I went back to college at 22 years old and I felt old because I'd spent four and a half years trying to be a golf pro. But I got over and said, okay, I'm going to... I'll play golf and it'll be, I still love it, but I, I'm going to have to do something for a living, right? So I went back and I felt old at 22, okay? And I got out of college when I was 25. I got my first real paycheck in the music business, not my own company that I started, where I got some guys to give me money to pay my bills, no money for me. It was to pay the bands and lose all of it, right? My first real job at 28 years old. How old are you guys? How old are you? 22. 20? 22. 28. 28. Okay, well, so, and by the way, you two guys are at that place where I was, who are, you're not the youngster, but you still are, you got some, you're, you're in the game now, so this is where it goes, okay? So, if you're 44, or you're 54, and you're thinking about making this a career, I think it's slightly different if you're an artist or a music professional. 
I'm bald. I'm 58 years old, but nobody cares because they're not really paying to see me perform, right? For all of the Incubus fans, people, they go, oh, he's that crazy old guy. It actually kind of works, okay? But if you're an artist, and we're being really honest, at 30, if you haven't made it as an artist, people are going, dude, I don't know. I don't know. We all drive down Sunset Boulevard here, and we all see that old 45-year-old guy who's in a heavy metal band with his black jeans on and his Keith Richards skull and crossbones belt buckle and his dyed black hair that he's now starting to do the comb over like Irving Rosenfeld on, you know, American Hustle, right? And that guy ain't going to make it in a rock band. Maybe if he was a country guy, maybe if he was an old blues guy, right? Maybe if he was a classical musician, I see John Williams, greatest composer of all time, is 80 years old, but nobody cares, okay? So the age thing is important because it does take time to develop. As you get a little bit older, you start to get more baggage. Get a wife, get a kid, get a mortgage, and man, you got a little ball and chain. So now when you decide to cut loose, and do something different, it's not just impacting you, it's impacting everybody else as a business person. I had a big job at Avalon Attractions. I married my wife six months later. I go, I'm quitting that job. What? She actually was very supportive, truth be told, honey, if you're watching. She was great, you know? And I went from making a nice chunk of dough to managing a bunch of bands, which I thought I wanted to do because it just looked so damn easy, right? And I remember sitting in a, in a freaking laundromat in New Jersey with some fat old gal with the stretch pants on and just going, what the hell did I just do, okay? Three, four years later, I had my first son, and I took a job working for Sony Music, okay? So those kind of things, that baggage, is what you need to be thinking about. Um, but there is no age limit, okay, on paper, but the reality of the business is a slightly different, right? Um, Here's something else I'm going to ask you guys, and we'll ask the people online. If I said to you, you're looking to do something big in your life, what are the two most likely outcomes in its simplest form? Uh, so, all right, so two, right? Just two. All right. Um, short answers. Okay, um, helping out or changing the Wrong. lives. This is not pertaining to music, but uh, changing the lives of uh, multiple people or... Wrong. Um, somewhere not. Yeah, I don't you know. You take a know. crack at it, Andrew. Well, you said what are the two, if you decide to do something great in your life, what are the two most fundamental, simple conclusions that are going to happen? Get married, have kids. Nope. Wrong. Victor. You do it or you don't. Bang. It's oh, either going to happen or it's not. I hit a shot and I'm hitting it for that tree. I'm either going to hit it or I'm not. God, life's not that simple. Really? It's not? You live, you die. What happens in between is worth discussion, but the simplest notion is you start, you end. Right? That's how it goes. So accepting the outcomes, right, is one of these big picture thoughts that allows you to free up, right? So if I said to you guys, I know what your dream is. I know what you're looking to do. I have a little sense of who you are. But if I said to you, what if it doesn't happen? Or actually, they may flip it around. What if it does happen? You go help all those people. You go travel. Over. What's that look like? What's the wind look like? Can't predict the future, so I'm not you don't have a picture in your head? I have a picture, but I have a picture, but you know, nothing is set in stone. And it could happen a million different ways. You know. You never thought about God. If I get, you know, if I hit a home run, I'd like to buy a house by the beach, or I'd like to have a little place, or I'd like to join a club where I could play golf every day. Have you never thought about that, or I, you just feel uncomfortable talking about it? Nah, nah I mean, I've thought that, but it was, it was never hitting the home run. It was always, it was always on stage. But then when reality okay. hit me, well, then let me it flip it the other way. Yeah. What if it doesn't happen? What if you're? What if it turns? You guys turn out just like me. I wanted to be a golf pro. Uh -huh. Did everything right. Did all the things that I just described here, and it didn't work out. What are you going to do then? I mean, simple as this, just continue to find whatever makes me happy. Bang, that's a great answer. Andrew? Uh, that's hard to follow up on. I mean, because I think, like, realistically, everyone wants you just to be happy. And uh, I kind of have chosen my career. But uh, I don't know, maybe you fall back on my college education and use that. I don't know. I would do whatever it takes just to be happy. Okay. All right. And, and Victor, I, I, not to cut you off, but, I, you know, go ahead. 
Oh, um, if yeah, it doesn't probably, work out, I guess that's a question. No, for yeah, you. Uh, if it doesn't work out, you know, go back to my degree and uh, maybe try to do something with my other hobbies I got. Okay. So, Sammy? It's not an option. Okay. All right. So I, I guess my point is, is that these are the things that go through your mind and that notion of time limit, right? Um, how long am I going to do it? In my head, I had the same thing. I'm just doing, there's no option on the end because you got to commit, right? We, we talked about that. You got to be all in. But it's like, at some point, if it's not working out, it's okay to think about something out if you gave it your best shot. That's what you'll take with you to your next ride, is that you gave it your shot. You won't be the 40-year-old person or the 54-year-old person, God bless you, you kids, okay, that are sitting there wondering, I, I should have done it, but I didn't. And those people that are 44 and 54, and again, God love you, okay, that you're revisiting that dream. I love the boldness of it, right? But... I think you're better off making that call sooner rather than later so, because you have a whole life to lead and in, in, in fulfillment can come in ways that you never really imagined, okay? So that time limit, all that stuff is important. If you're gonna be successful, at some point having done the homework, done the right things, you know, getting your head in the right place, when your moment comes, okay, and that train pulls in the station, the thing that kind of glues it all together is you have to trust. You have to trust that you've made the right decisions. You trust that you've made the right calls. Trust that you're on the right path because indecision in that moment is the killer, right? So that's the recipe for getting the dreaming and doing part done, okay? Any questions? Questions from online? Um, we have somebody who asked me to ask you this. It's a little bit off topic, kind okay. of, but well, he's keep... asked me like three times. Okay. He's from, he's Fernando from Spain, from a small city. Hola, Fernando. <laughs> he wants to know how his band can go out to Europe and be heard. That's a long answer, Fernando, but I'm going to tell you this. If you watch for 12 weeks, or if you want to fast track and want to spend some time going through some videos and you do the work, not me, okay? I already covered, man, all right? That's not an easy answer, but go find out some questions. Go do some homework and come to me with something specific, okay? Not one of these general, hey, man, how can I be a big band? You know, it's too long an answer. I need you to do some homework. Remember I set up, you got to do your homework, okay? So I'm not trying to wind you up. Happy to have you here, Fernando. Too long an answer. Do some homework. Come back over the next 12 weeks, and I'll help you answer that question. You had a question. Yeah, so, uh, you know, back, back in your early, early days, you know, getting into the business, what was your picture that you had in your head when you were initiating? I had always loved going to concerts. I was, even when I was playing golf, I loved going to concerts. That was my day. If I could play golf in the day and rock at night and party with my buddies, that was a win. You know what the joke of it is or the, the great news is? That's still a perfect day for me. OK, go out and play some golf, go have dinner at the gig, watch the show, bang, done. Right. So that is important, you know, because it kind of was that was out there that was starting to show itself as, as a target. Right. And sometimes these targets aren't always you know, obvious right out of the box here. Um, so that was, you know. That was what was guiding me. I worked at a country club when I played golf. There were lots of showbiz people around there. Jerry Weintraub, a manager, big guys in the agency business, big guys running studios, right? So I was surrounded by that. So once the golf thing started to wear away, right, I definitely had a notion that I would be in the entertainment business, but I thought I'd do what Beverly Hills kids do. You go to law school, right? And so I started to follow that path. That path led me to Santa Monica College, got on the debate team. And this is where I talk about sometimes life takes you in places you hadn't anticipated. I get on the debate team because I thought if you're going to be a lawyer, you got to get up in front of people and talk, right? Um, makes sense. Debate coach says you should be on the debate or the speech coach or speech communication class. That got me on the debate team. He goes, we need a budget. Randy, we're running you for student government. I said, student government? Dude, I'm not a student. Well, you're going to be in student government. I ran for that. And then here's where the, the interesting twist is. I wound up becoming the vice president of the school. The guy who booked concerts didn't like talking to agents or record company people. He said, would you do that? He said, you'll talk to a tree. And I said, yeah, I'll talk to a tree and I'll talk to those. That was how I started in the business. So that little entree to be in the concert promoter 
led me into the scoring zone, as we say in the business. So it was like a whole progression of different life happenings, I guess you could say. It was guided by a love of the concerts. It was guided by the fact that I'd seen a lot of this in my experience in my other thing that didn't work out. Get the picture here, folks, right? And that was the start. That we had a concert promoter was how I met all so many different managers of successful bands and saw some people that were just knuckleheads and think I could do that. And of course, in the great music business tradition, I was looking at end result, not the path to get there. And the end result always looks easier than the path. So it took me. I managed 10 bands. None of them were successful. The 11th band I managed was Incubus. That was a home run. Okay, we'll talk about that later with timing and lighting. Um, any more questions? We'll move on. All right. So. Fuck the gatekeepers. People ask me, I got an email the other day or a tweet. Some guy goes, sir, I love your catchphrases. I don't know, what, what does that fuck the gatekeepers mean? I think he was a little scared, right? And I said, well, here's what fuck the gatekeepers is. Um, it's an attitude. It's my personal battle cry. It's an acknowledgement of the fact that you're going to face countless obstacles on your way to wherever it is you're going, particularly true in the music business, but true in any business. Um, so for me, you can cry about those obstacles, you can complain about them, you can whine to your wife or your girlfriend and ask for your blue blankie, but that won't get the problem solved. So for me, fuck the gatekeepers is my personal mantra. Something comes up and I'm not getting, here's where I am, there's where I wanna be, there's an obstacle in the way, I run up against it and go, you know what, okay, that's a problem, you know, but instead of spending all day yapping about it and crying about it and bitching about it, I sit there and go, fuck them, I'm gonna find a way to make this happen. Pardon me all the F stuff here, folks, but that's what it is. Um, that's what fuck the gatekeepers is. Um, people ask me, well, so Ren, I mean, like, who are these gatekeepers you're talking about, right? The gatekeepers, again, it's more concept than anything reality. It can be anything that stands between you and where you want to be. So it could be on a personal level. It could be a boss that's not quite seeing things the way it is. It could be a friend that's hosed you or did something stupid that's like then you can't confront it. It could be, instead of a person, it could be a situation. It could be office politics. It could be some bigger picture thing that's going on that's stalling you that winds up being a, a gatekeeper of sorts. In a more practical sense, if we're talking about who are the gatekeepers in the music business, I was having this conversation with Michelle today. And, and, and pissing her off too, going, who are the gatekeepers? If she wants to get a record deal, the gatekeepers is you gotta get to a record company. And in front of that record company is an A&R person like Andrew Brichetti, and maybe you won't return my calls. And I've sent you 18 freaking emails, man. And I'm only worried about me. I'm not thinking that you might have 6,000 other tapes, 8,000 people. But hey man, you're not returning my calls, so you're a gatekeeper. You know, you know what I say to you? Fuck that Andrew Brichetti. I'm gonna find my way around him or I'm gonna find a way to him, okay? But he's not gonna stop me, right? That's what fucked the gatekeepers here. Once you get that record deal, Michelle, who do you need to get your music on the radio? Programmer, thank programmer. you. I guess she forgot again, okay? Um, you need radio programmers. Everybody wants to be on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. You wanna get all that big press, but it either happens or it doesn't, simple, right? In the old days, you're out of business. Today, artists can tell their own story on social media, on their own websites. And big media publications are watching the Twitter feeds and the Facebook feeds of the big artists that they used to pitch for stories. And more often than not, they're telling the story that the artists wanted to tell. That's a big game-changing thing. Um, iTunes today, it used to be Tower Records, Virgin Records, all these physical stores that guys that are 22 years old didn't even know about. Okay, Matt Ray, were you ever even in a record store? Not really, okay? But that used to be a big gatekeeper. How do I get my records in these stores and then how do I get paid? Now any artist in the world can solve the distribution problem. You can put your stuff on iTunes, you could put it on TuneCore. Can you get front racked in that store that's not, you don't really walk in anymore, but there's stuff on the front page, right? That's the front rack, no different than the old world but everybody can play. So that gatekeeper out of business. You used to worry about MTV, now your video's on YouTube, right? You used to worry about Microsoft, now everybody's worried about Google. Those are gatekeepers out there. Doesn't mean they're all bad, they're just things that you need to deal with and get an idea about how to deal with them, right? Fuck the gatekeepers. If you guys are indie artists, Victor Hightain, right? Yep. 
fuck the gatekeepers is like should be the battle cry for indie artists, right? Because the truth of the matter is you are on the outside looking in. Fair comment? Yep. I don't want to be part of that club. Well, actually, I do want to be part of that club, but I haven't been invited. That's what I used to say when I was an indie promoter. I'd go, hey, those guys are having hell with those guys. I don't want to be part of that. I met with that guy, Bob Getty, who was kind of offering me a job. I'm like, hey, Bob, I want to be the king of my own castle. And Bob looks across and goes, kid, you don't have a castle. You don't have a castle. The next thing he did was book a show in my castle, and my castle was made of sand and crumbled, and I took the job the next week. Almost talked myself out of it, right? So, you know, the battle cry for you guys is I got to make something happen. It's a reminder that to innovate, to overcome, to be more clever. Why? You got to be the Viet Cong because you guys can't afford a full out battle. You can't get in that exchange and win. It would be suicide walking. So fuck the gatekeepers is I'm going to figure out how to crack this safe. And these assholes aren't even going to know I showed up in the night, right? It's a, it's a battle cry to use all the new tools at your disposal. You used to have to rent a big studio to record a great record. Now you can do it on GarageBand or Pro Tools. You used to have to go and spend $500,000, $600 million making a video. Now a kid can go get his Canon 5D camera and make it look like it was a, like a top-line movie for no money because his buddy is working at a college or whatever. And so fuck the gatekeepers saying, hey, be clever, make something happen. That's what uh, fuck the gatekeepers. I talked about this indie artist mentality. I want to play you a little clip. Here. I'm going to introduce to you another one of the people that have been a part of our show, an unbelievably talented, driven guy who embodies the spirit of Fuck the Gatekeeper. His name is Jack Conte, right? He's in a band called Pomplamoose. He's never had a big record deal, never been on a big national tour, never had any of that kind of stuff, but he's managed to build a following for himself, 250000 on YouTube. He's actually making a living as a musician, and he's built it all outside the mainstream of the business, which 10, 15 years ago would have been impossible. Play the clip, because here's what Fuck the Gatekeepers looks like for today's artists. Artists are these creatures on a perfect cloud, vomiting beauty into the world. And that's just not what it is anymore. It's, look, I'm a dude, and I work fucking hard, and I put stuff out into the world because I like it. And other people see that and feel inspired because they're like, I can do that too. That's the new motto. Beethoven did that. Mm -hmm. He wrote his, he wrote for the Fifth Symphony, right? People paid him to make that. He didn't make yeah. that for free. Yeah. People pay, here's a bag of coins. Go write some good shit. <laughs> and he did, and he wrote really good stuff because he was making money to pay his bills. Yeah. Um, for me, doing yeah. a cover of a pop song on YouTube, then you look at iTunes sales that day and they've skyrocketed. Well, lots of bands, Billy Joel was doing covers in a the, freaking bar in Long Beatles. Island. The Beatles, three you. albums of covers. Thank like, you. To all those songs Thank are you. all covers. Thank you. Frank so, Sinatra never did an original his entire life. Thank you, the issue's not getting paid. It's getting fans. Initially, it's getting heard, right? Yeah. Can you imagine if Beethoven was living in today's world? Or Mozart and these guys? Dude, he would love synthesizers. He would be using Ableton Live and he'd be cracking on Massive. It would be amazing. Yeah. Right? For the first time in history, mm. you can tell the world what you have to say for free. There are only two states of being in the music business. Nowhere and somewhere, and that anything in between was really just a snapshot of somebody going up or on their way back down. And, and now there's this class of people who, are, who have a million subscribers on YouTube or 200,000 subscribers on YouTube, and they sell 10,000 songs a month on iTunes. <laughs> tens of thousands of people like this. It's mm. literally tens of thousands of people who are putting art into the world and making or almost making a living. Yeah. They're very close. They need a little bit of help, and Patreon is the kind of thing that just pushes them over the now, edge. Can I ask you want to surround yourself with people who give a damn. People who care about your cause. If someone is thinking, oh, I should be doing that, or I could be doing this and making a little more money or doing that, it's like, no, you want to be with somebody who's in it. The smart people, <laughs> that's who you want to hang out with. A, it raises your game and brings more to the party, plain and simple. It's not elitist, it's just smart. Yeah, each song is a, is, I hate to say it each song is a product you know and mm -hmm. and you have to sell every product in the whole catalog otherwise they don't they don't sell it's making great music as a musician today that's half your job you have to care about the art a hundred percent 
and you have to care about the business 100%. You owe it to yourself to make money from it, otherwise you're never gonna be able to make more music, right? You Bang. owe it to yourself and to the world. If you have something to say, you have to figure out how to make money from it so that you can say more. All right, so that's how artists are working around the gatekeepers. They're making music at home. They're using digital distribution instead of brick and mortar. They're making clever videos for no money. They're making YouTube their channel, not MTV. And they're telling their own story uh, through social media. Like, that's game-changing stuff. And he's really a model for how to get everything right. Uh, so bottom line is that this whole fuck the gatekeeper thing is that if you want to succeed in today's music business, not the music business that served me well, uh, but today's music, that's what you guys get. You sitting around reminiscing with me will only bum you out. But I'm with you today in today's music business. And if you're going to be in today's music business, you have to accept there are no entitlements. You deserve nothing. You're owed nothing. OK, nobody cares about you at all unless you build that value. You'll get what you play for and you can call your mantra, your battle cry, anything you want. I call it fuck the gatekeepers. All right. So I want to talk about another big picture concept here. And this is one that pertains to both artists and professionals. And it's this idea I call finding your true north. Right. And what it really is, uh, is about. Who am I really? Who am I? What am I all about? So I'll speak from about myself. For me, I always loved being the captain. I always wanted to be the guy driving the car. I was always willing to give you my opinion even if it wasn't asked. I was always willing to go the extra mile. I always loved going to concerts. I loved hanging out with musicians. And that is really who I am. So while I started as a concert promoter and got to pay musicians and work with them that way, all I started to see was the guy that was the manager who was dealing with the band, the promoter was talking, the record label, and I sat there and thought, well, that's me, man. See, I'm the captain. I should be a manager, right? And so I ultimately did that when it had some little twists and turns along the way. But that guy in me that wanted to drive, that was happy and willing to accept responsibility, even for ideas that weren't mine, if it helped get us from point A to point B, is part of who I am. That person pisses off a lot of people, but that person is also very reliable. So that's who I am. Michelle Wrights in here is a musician. She's a songwriter. She's a smart lady. She could do um, any number of things, but she's got a passion to do this. And just the other day, Michelle asked me to listen to some music. She's been kind enough to help me out in here. And so I thought it would be only fitting that I should sit there and ask to help solve some of her problems. So she asked me to listen to her music, and we listened to it. And I said, when I listen to those songs, based on me what I know of you, I'm trying to figure out which of those songs, all great, all great vocal performance, are the real you. Is that something you're trying to figure out still today, Michelle? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been writing for years, still trying to find that right mm -hmm. particular niche, I guess you would say. But tell me if I'm wrong. You, yeah. I'm betting you have all kinds of people that will tell you what they think you should do. Oh, yeah. And I'm betting you're, you're, you're polite and that you listen, but... As you get a little bit older, as you get more into doing it, I'm betting you're starting to have a sense of who that real person is Absolutely. and perhaps evaluating how that's going to play in the world. Is that true? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So it's kind of a moving target. My point is this. you got to figure out who you are as a business person and as an artist. Willie Nelson's the example I use. They tried to get Willie Nelson into the, what was back in the old pop days of Nashville, put him in a suit and all that stuff. And if I showed you some of those album covers of Willie Nelson in the suit, you wouldn't even recognize it because for him, and in your mind, he's the outlaw. He's the guy with the bandit. He's the guy smoking pot, and they're pulling him over in the bus, and the smoke's coming out, and he forgot to pay his taxes, but he did forget, didn't forget to pay his musicians, right? But he forgot to pay the government because that's who he really is, and he's 80 years old, and he's still doing it, right? <laughs> Um, if you're an artist and you're trying to figure out what your artistic vision is, right, that's really the most important thing because whether you're going to be signed to a record label or a manager, they want artists, truth be told, maybe not true in the pop world, but for real artists, they want artists that have a clear sense of who they are where they, because they don't have to do the work. They don't have to try to sell somebody on what you should be. I can tell you this. I worked with Incubus for 16 years. I never told them what to write. 
never told him what to wear. I would have some discussions about set list because I had some thoughts. That was just the Bill Walsh coach me going, I think we start with this plan and with this plan in between, we mix it up. But the point is they had their own artistic vision and love them or hate them, success or failure was all theirs. All of every bit of IFD was theirs. And that's what you need to do if you're gonna be successful as an artist, you know? Now I mentioned earlier that, you know, getting a target and finding out who you are, it's not like it's a big light. It's not like it's clear as a bell all the time. It's a process, it's an evolution, but it's inside of you trying to come out. I wanna introduce you to another friend of mine. We won't play a video, but it's a gentleman by the name of Tom Kelly. One of you guys met his son. Um, and Tom Kelly was a big time songwriter, wrote some of the biggest hits for the, uh, women that you can imagine. Hit me with your best shot, true colors, you know, on and on. Hall of Fame songwriter. Tom started off to be in a band. He wanted to be a singer in the band. And it just never, ever happened to him. And to those people that were asking questions about when to start and all of that, then he got married and then he had kids. And then it, was, it, it dawned on him, you know what? Maybe my destiny, maybe my calling isn't to be the guy singing. Maybe it's the guy to be writing and I'll let somebody else do the work. I'll let Pat Benatar do it. I'll let uh, Madonna sing Like a Virgin, written by two guys, right? Uh, all of that stuff. And so he's made an unbelievable living, feels very fulfilled, has had a chance to watch all his kids grow up. And that worked out great, but that wasn't exactly what he had in mind in the beginning. Does that make sense to you guys? Any questions from you, from you lot? Any questions for online? Uh, nope, not yet, just stories. All right, okay, <laughs> good. Um, okay, um, that's the true North thing. It's kind of a ethereal thing, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Picking your partners. Let's talk about picking your partners. Before I talk about picking your partners, I'm gonna play you a video that highlights Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. It should, they should make every person that ever wants to be in the music, every band member watch this video. It's a highlight film of what happens when you don't pick the right partners. Play it for me, would you dig? What a lot of people don't know is the Turtles were in lawsuits from 1966 to 1974. We trusted everybody, we believed, and we'd sign anything. Here's a brief description of the managerial problems faced by a rock and roll band, us. Here's what happened. First of all, our first manager came along. He's the guy who owned the nightclub, remember him? Yeah. He convinced us he was good by telling us, I'm your manager. We signed. We believed Good him. enough for us. Manager number one, now we got a manager. We all went right. out on the road with this guy right here. Call him two. We'll call him number two. He told us that manager number one was no good. He said he was a crook. Said manager number one hated us, stole our money, never wanted to see us again. So he said, what should we do, sign with you? Yeah. So we believed him. Sign with number two. We went to our record company and we borrowed $250,000. We paid manager number one $50,000 of our money. Our money money cash. cash we promised manager one five payments of fifty thousand dollars manager number two now we're really poor we're out on the road he takes our contract and sells it to a company in new york and told us it was a new agency we believed him there was no agency no 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 so he gave us that money told us it was an advance but it wasn't an advance it was the other money he, he sold stole. them fifty percent of our managerial contract and then we didn't make the next payment on on our on our loan. Remember the loan? Default. So number one now is suing us right about this time for two and one half million dollars because we owe him money. So now we don't like number three, a no. bunch of swarthy oh, geeks from bad, uh, bad New York. New York and number two, of course, has run off to Mexico with our bass player's wife and forty thousand dollars of tour money. Wife money Mexico down here and we are with a new road manager who tells us that number three is really bad we already know that we so, hate three anyway so we sign with manager number four we're now with manager number four and he brings in a lawyer let's just call her lawyer and she's really bad for us oh, she ruins our man. career really bad as if we needed help can we, we just reiterate manager number one still suing us two okay. and a half million dollars million. so now we're out on the road with a new guy he tells us manager number four is not doing anything good. Manager four goes up north and we sign with manager number five, if I manager if I got five. this right. Okay, We're still being sued right. two and a half million dollars. Manager number six comes in. Big, big managers. Big company, a big TV star. Still a big TV star. Very successful. Famous, like number one show kind of a TV 
Star. We hate them. Hate so them. we leave hate them. them. Hate. We leave them and we go with two guys. Two of those guys we didn't hate. We, two, we two stayed of them. with they them. Were good. They became manager number seven. Let us again point out. Suing us. Suing us. Still, suing still us. all the way over here. Manager number seven were pretty good. They brought us to the White House. That's stuff. right. We had a good run. But then you know what? We hated them. We didn't like them yeah, anymore. They working. had dogs. Right over here. Remember okay. number three. We settled we with settled manager with number three. three. We give him $25,000 cash. Manager number one is still suing. Two, Two and, and a half million dollars. So we come over here. But also manager number one is very popular now. Got big on our big money. On big. money. The 50000 So we come back to, we'll call it number eight guy, number one manager. We call him up and say, hey, you were always the guy. He, we love you, He man. throws out the lawsuit because now we're friends, we become his new group, and then we break up. Uh, now, that's true. The band's called the Turtles. If you're out there, Google them. They had a big hit called Happy Together. They must have written that song before all this stuff happened. That clip right there, which seems like a joke, it's every bit of it's true, highlights why picking your partners is important stuff, okay? Because if you're gonna succeed in the music business, you're gonna need some help, and picking the right folks to do it has a huge impact on your success or failure. So when you're out there looking at bands that have succeeded for a period of time, more often than not, you'll find the same manager with them, same record company, they're not changing horses a lot, right? Here's what the right partners will have. Whether you're a musician, you know, or it's a manager's partner or whatever, they're gonna share common goals. You're gonna be looking for the same target. Um, they will have an, a commitment that equals yours, okay? If you're in the band together and he's not doing the work and you are, that's gonna be a problem at some point. They would have a similar work ethic, right? Or that becomes an issue. Um, they would um, have requisite skill levels, right? If you guys are trying to play top quality and you're always playing around the drummer because he's a nice guy but he really can't play, and by the way, this has happened, they've covered it with studio musicians and so forth, Ultimately, that will be a problem, right? So um, for musical partners, you know, if you share the same musical mentality, if you're in a rock band but your bass player wants to play jazz and so every time you're playing a rock, he's putting in something that doesn't need to be there, those will, you're smiling, those will be things that you as an A&R guy will be officiating over in, in, in trying to negotiate that and it winds up being a waste of everybody's time. I use the analogy of the, you know, hiring your drummer because he had a PA system and you guys really needed a PA system and the singer wanted to sound really great. So the guy that had the basketball or the PA makes it on the team, but you really hate him and you can't do it, that will come undone too. The most important thing for a musician, I will tell you from my experience with a number of bands, is that they get along. You can be the greatest bass player in the world, the greatest keyboard, greatest guitar player in the world, but if you can't get along with the other guys in the band, because you gotta live with them as well as work with them, that will be a problem, right? Um, if you're a professional, you need to hire people that are up to the task. If you need a lawyer, and some guy goes, I'll do that contract, and he's really kind of a second-rate real estate attorney, you need him to do a first-rate music deal, bad call, that will be a problem. Remember the lawyer, okay, in, in the analogy here. Um, what happens if you don't get it right? Watch the video. Lawsuits, band breakups, all of that stuff. This idea of getting the right partners is really difficult to get, but you have to get it right. And the common denominator between most successful artists that have had a career 10, 20, 30 years is they got those calls right, okay? Um, let me tell you something else about getting it wrong. As you saw in this video, much easier to bring somebody into the partnership, hire somebody, than it is to get rid of them because you're making contractual commitments to each other. It's not lightweight stuff. People will sue and they will go crazy over it. When you've got a bad guy in the band, I'll speak from some personal experience here without mentioning names, the band guy that you threw up because you made the bad call, you see it and get rid of them, they don't go away easily. Some of them stalk you. Some of them keep coming back. Some of them just won't go away. And you spend all kinds of money 
on somebody that you got rid of 10, 15 years ago. So these are real things. That notion of picking your partners, folks, is a big picture call that can't be underestimated. So be careful about the first guy that says he wants to be your manager or the second person that can tell you everything that the first guy is doing wrong and the second and the third and on and on and on because too often you get the ending that these guys describe that look like a joke is the band breaks up, okay? Now, um, you wanna help people, you wanna help people, I want to help people, but I never lost sight of the fact that I wanted to make a living out of this. And you know what the defining difference between a you know a hobby and a living is? Let me hear it. Huh? So let me hear it. You get paid. All right. Okay? You get paid. You pay your rent. You pay for your kids' ed. That's how you know it's a living. It's a job, right? So while I love my job, it's a job. I do it to make money. And so if you're a musician or a professional person, important that you understand that, right? There you go, get the money. Where was that? Give me that one again, D. Threw in a wall, but oh, get the money, right? Um, this is an idea that artists are horribly uncomfortable talking about, it, but it's something you need. You need to understand the value of money because it'll guide you on a number of decisions. If you're lucky enough to make it in the music business, artist or professional, uh, my advice would be to be smart about it and keep it. Okay, you've been to my house days because I've, didn't blow it all on a bunch of other stuff here, right? So um, for professional types, right? It is the single most important. If you're a manager, if you're working for a record label, trust me, Andrew, they want you to make money. You can go help all the world. Go, That's freaking great, Andrew. You're gonna help me too, man. I need to make money because I need to pay you and you and you and you, right? So getting the money is something we take very seriously. I, I, I kid about it all the time that we have it up. Do you have a picture of Joe and uh, Cody's desk there? There it is. That's what hangs over Joe's desk. He's much more modest than Cody. Get the money. Get the money. It sits right over their desk because I want them to know. What are you saying, Joe? It's not about the flash. It's all about the cash. <laughs> there you go. That's Joe Lilac in there. He comes in with a big singer here. It's not something you need to be self-conscious about, okay? If you sold 10 million records, uh, Victor... Would you expect to get a little cashish out of that? Uh, yeah. Okay. You feeling guilty about it? You did all that work. You grinded for eight years, and now you have a chance to make some money. Are you feeling guilty about it? Not at all. Okay, and you shouldn't, okay? So artists that get all screwy in their head about, I don't want to talk about money because it's about the art. Of course it's about the art. But if the art isn't right, we can't make the money. But if you got the art right, and you did all those things right, and you didn't get the money, and you're sitting there at the end of it going, I sold all these records, I played all these concerts, and I'm broke, you're MC Hammer, doing a commercial sitting on the curb going, Jesus Christ, what the F happened? Don't be that guy, right? So I don't know why artists are uncomfortable talking about it. It's not something you need to obsess about. Money shouldn't be the driver of why you did it in the first place. But if you did something that we talked about at the top that you were passionate about, that you could make a living out of it, that's okay, okay? Don't be the artist that gets screwed. Remember, it's just money. I've said this for years to Inc., but I've said it to every man. It's just money. It's no big, it's just money. Your money, and your money, and your money, right? So take care of it, right? Um, let me tell you where sometimes artists and managers and people that are part of the process get too wacky. They get a creative vision going. Any of you guys read this recent rant by Lady Gaga, who is trying to fulfill her vision? And she's been betrayed by all the people that support her, that she trusted, her label, her manager, her publisher. They betrayed her, okay? Now, best I could tell, when it was all going well, she was the architect of the creative vision. I have this vision of what I want to do. And so perhaps they spent way too much money recording a record, because if the song was great, you don't need to spend a million dollars polishing it up. I think of one of my old management clients, Miles Hunt from The Wonder Stuff, if you're watching, who had one of the greatest lines in the world. Can't polish a turd into a diamond, no matter how much you spend, no matter how hard you try. If you're spending so much money on videos and forget that in most record contracts, the artist is paying about 90% of the cost of those videos, and that when you sold those five million records and you get the royalties, you have to understand, why? Well, how come I don't have any money here? Well, you made your vision. You wanted to do that $2 million video. And I mentioned, wow, that's really, oh, no, no. Support me. Support me. What are you, fighting me? These are things that really go on. Now that gets made, and now we got some more money. 
tour. I saw Lady Gaga tour. She may, oh, she, maybe she'll be tweeting about me. No disrespect. Love the tour. It's biggest tour I've ever seen, biggest production I've ever seen inside an arena. And keep in mind, I was a concert promoter for seven years where we did 300 shows. I saw every big rock act, pop act for the last 30 years I've seen them. Never seen anything that big and spectacular. She hurts her hip and at the end of the week, they wind up losing a truckload of money and the end of it is, I want to apologize to my fans for all the people that betrayed me. And it's difficult for me to believe that they did that willfully. The same people that helped get her there were the ones that willfully hosed her in the end, and I say, for what reason? Because if she's not making any money, they're not making any money, right? So balancing that creative vision, you artists out there, and you managers and you professionals that are part of the process is a, an important thing, and it all starts with this idea of getting the money. Let me talk some more about money, this idea uh, uh, of money. Um, Money is the key driver in success in the music. You gotta have money to make the record. You gotta have money to promote it. You gotta have money to tour it. All of that stuff, right? <clears throat> and nobody has succeeded at the highest levels of the business, top of the charts, top of the pole star charts, without having access to big money. Um, if you're gonna be paying, the best way to look at ideas about spending money is making believe that you were spending your own money, right? If I said to an artist, hey, uh, what do you want? Oh, I got my buddy who wants to do this video. It's costing $150,000. I can't believe we're not going to make this happen. And I said, OK, record company pay for it. Here, you got money. You pay for it. And then all, if it's a different conversation, you're going, well, hold it, hold it, hold it. It was much more money, fun spending your money than my money. Then you're looking at it wrong because you need to have respect for the money. Because money, no matter whose money it is, wants an opinion, OK? As I told you, money doesn't have brains. Money doesn't have conscience. Money doesn't know where to go. It's just money. Your money. People tell it what to do. People make it smart. People make it stupid. People give it direction, right? Money always, though, wants an opinion. And if you're the ones writing the check, you will have the ultimate opinion in the end. Um, so those are some big picture thoughts about making money. Uh, how are you going to get that money? It's either going to be family, it's going to be personal funds, might be a more traditional record company or publisher, right? Maybe you can raise money on Kickstarter campaign. But in any event, no matter where you get that money, it will have an expectation attached to it, right? That's just the nature of the beast. Money wants an opinion, right? Opinion about the song, an opinion about the producer, an opinion about your vision, opinion about that tour. Money wants an opinion, okay? And rather than fight it and deny it, better to understand it and respect it. If somebody that's giving you the money to fulfill your dream, or you're the one giving the money from, on behalf of somebody else to help fulfill that dream, and if they don't want to listen to it, I'm telling you, that's not a good scenario. It speaks to entitlement. It speaks to losing the vision over money. It's an honest conversation. So whatever you're going to do, Make believe you're writing the check and you'll appreciate it. But I'll tell you some advice I've learned the hard way. Never piss on your banker's foot if you intend to come back again. Be honest, be engaging, understand that they have an opinion. Big picture level, and this is a lot easier to get your arms around. Okay. Make sense? Any questions, Michelle, online? <clears throat> see. Anybody got any questions? Okay, I've, I've stumped them now. Okay. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of comments. Okay. A what lot are of people some of the are comments? agreeing that <clears throat> money, money has strings. Of course it Don't does. Don't get in debt. Build your music career from cash flow. If you can do that, easier said <laughs> than done. Yeah. Easier said than done. Okay. Um, I mentioned at the top here that everybody's getting started. When I started in the business, um, I was constantly reading. I remember reading about Clive Davis. I remember reading about Richard Branson. I remember reading about anybody I could reading Billboard magazine because I was interested <clears throat> in how people got started in the hopes that I might be able to see something that somebody else did that might be relevant for me. So over the next 10, 11 weeks, I'm going to highlight some great stories of getting started in the hopes that they'll inspire. And the first one I'm going to do is a gentleman by the name of Neil Jacobson. He's one of my golfing buddies, a good friend of mine, wonderfully talented A&R guy, who is a wonderful matchmaker. He plays in this pop world where it's get this producer and get that writer and 
mixing and matching, much different world than I grew up where it's like, hey, Incubus, you guys write the songs, and when you're done, I'll give you my two cents, and then we'll get a plan, right? So I want to play you the story of Neil Jacobs, because I think it speaks to a traditional start, non-traditional middle, and a great ending. So I'll play the clip, and then uh, hopefully it'll get you guys inspired a little bit. Give us a little uh, bit of history about Neil Jacobs and how you got in the music business and, <clears throat> and what you're doing here today. Good. I am uh, uh, happy to be here with, uh, with you in the show. I think the website's brilliant and I'm happy to support it. I really do. I love it. And uh, getting to watch you for any protracted amount of time is, is awesome. Uh, I'm from New York. I grew up in Long Island. Um, wanted to be in the music business starting when I was about 15 years old. I, uh, at 17, I somehow got myself into Berklee College of Music, and I'm not being humble. I'm telling you I'm not a great musician, but I practiced my ass off my junior and senior year of school so that I could get in. Uh, the second I got in, I began not practicing anymore and getting back into the music business side. Um, I went to Berklee School of Music for, uh, for music business and a film scoring minor, actually, randomly. Um, Started a record label at Berkeley, uh, wasted about $5,000 of my father's money, um, but had a blast. Uh, after music school, couldn't get a job in the music industry to save my life, became a wholesale carpet salesman. Um, sold carpet for a company called Star Carpet, which I actually loved, and, uh, and did that for about three years, uh, wholesaling floor coverings. Um, uh, uh, I still had the hankering, still missed the business. Um, and after uh, a few years in carpet, I took an unpaid internship at a record label via a guy named Tom Ennis, who I think you're friends with, sure. uh, who I used to caddy at at a country club called Deepdale Club in, uh, in New York. Um, I sort of cold called him out of the blue after a couple of years, and I think he was a little like, uh, Neil who? What? Uh, yeah, he's been having a few caddies. Um, so I built him a website, it was like 2002, and it was called HireMeTom.com. It was this terrible, really awful website, and it was like a picture of me, you know, with my thumb up, and another page down was top 10 reasons to hire Neil, and, uh, and a resume on another, it was awful, but it was funny, and uh, I just got a kick out of it, introduced me to somebody who gave me an internship at Arista. Um, I started interning at Arista and got a chance to move up to the Star Trek um, sub-label within Arista, which was Pharrell's label at the time. Um, I worked there for a little while, for a few months, interning for free. Uh, nice. Doing, By the way, doing, I don't know if I ever told you, just doing rug tents. I would sell Bloomingdale's rug tents on weekends for 15 hours a day from, you know, seven in the morning until 10 o'clock at night on my feet, just hawking rugs. Um, but I could make enough money on the weekends to be able to intern during the week at like 24, 25 years old. Um, and then a friend of mine who was working at Interscope told me that he was leaving and I should check out his position as an assistant. Um, I flew out to LA, I interviewed for it with a guy named Martin Kiersenbaum who, I don't know, you talk about a guest you need to have on this show. If there's one guy who has been I just think he's like the smartest guy in the music industry and been tremendous for my career. Um, he, at the time, was the head of international and a senior VP of A&R uh, at Interscope. I interviewed with him, he gave me a job. I flew out and moved out with a duffel bag and a set of golf clubs and, uh, and started working at Interscope about 10 years ago. So let me get this straight. You gave up a promising career <laughs> in the carpet business uh, to join the music business. I Much to that. my parents' dismay. All right, getting started, <clears throat> getting started. It's the toughest thing to do, and I'm gonna keep showing you these stories because I want you to know there's as many different stories of getting started as there are people in here. I'm gonna ask all of you to watching out there today, what's gonna be your story of how you got started? A couple questions from the uh, chat room, Michelle. Yes, uh, speaking of getting started, Jody Fire first says hi. JD Fire, JD, JD Fire, Fire. Jody how Fire. you doing, JD? He says, what are the best sources of funding for a new artist? I think we went over them, JD. The best source of funding, um, I suppose, would be your own money because you control it and you're the only opinion you have to worry about. Uh, but for most people, that's not a realistic option. 
And if I had to say what's the best source of funding, if you buy that money doesn't have brains, it doesn't have conscience, it doesn't know where to go, then I would take from some money from people that have a conscience, that know where it goes, that can give it direction. And typically, that's a well-funded, uh, well-focused record label. Bigger the better, if you ask me, okay? And, uh, and while I love the whole indie spirit, that's the reality. I would take, if you wanted to fight a war, let's put it in that example, would you want to come in there with a couple bow and arrows and a couple of guys screaming, or would you want to come in there with cruise missiles, F-16s, you know, a couple battleships? Me, if I'm going to war, I want to bring every damn thing we can because I want to end it fast. I'm not going to be the sniper. I'm going to say, sniper here. Can we just blow that whole building up? Great. So but we killed the building. Well, we got the sniper too. Next. <laughs> OK. What else you got, Michelle? Uh, we got from Avenger stuff. Are there alternate sources of funding to cover building a fan base? We've talked like Indiegogo. Yes. There's all kinds of things. Out. Yeah. Indiegogo, Kickstarter, uh, Patreon. Our, our buddy Jack, uh, Jack Conte not only is a musician, but he's a, a, an entrepreneur who started a website called Patreon. I invite you to go on the Remman MB website, click on the guest list, check, click on Jack Conte, and you, re, you can not read about it. See, I've got I'm my old school. You can listen all about it. He'll tell you the story better than I can. What else? Um, let's see. Genesis. Genesis. Or genius? I don't know. Genius. Yeah, genius. genius. Spelled in a very we'll interesting way. You're genius. Uh, so money, what if you don't have any direct connections to people who can help fund you, or if it's very difficult to fund yourself? Some people find it difficult to even get a job nowadays. Okay, I agree. <laughs> What's your point? What's you know, point? the point of it is, is that you're going to need to find it. That's that fuck the gatekeeper mentality. There is no easy answers out there, not to be flip about it. There are no easy answers. We've said it was tough. We said it will test you in every way possible. And we said you're going to need to find an attitude of when you hit the obstacle, I don't have the money, how are you going to find it, right? People are doing it out there, okay? People, some guy came up with this idea. Okay, I'm going to go raise money for my pet project with a bunch of people that don't even know me. Now, if you'd have said that to me six, seven years ago, I'd have thought you were smoking crack. I'd go, you got to be kidding me. Who's going to give money to somebody they don't even know? But they're doing it. We raise money for our web show to help you know, pay for some of the stuff around here because people liked what we were doing and we're willing to give us money. So, but you got to build something up to get there. Um, buy a computer, make the music on your garage band, okay? And then when you get a bigger rig, go to Pro Tools, right? If you want to make a video, if you don't have a camera, go to a film school, find some guy that wants to make a video. I and mean, he'll bring along his, you know, Canon 5D Mark III camera. And, and he'll do his thing. All the equipment we have in this room today, which, you know, would, would probably be a little beyond the reach of most people, it would have cost millions of dollars 10 years ago. We can do a big time show, make it look like TV from my office. So you, the, the bottom line is you can do it. I don't have the easy check all answer, except you got to make it happen. <laughs> and I'd be, invite him to tell me how he did it when he's done, <laughs> because that's a story that, he, that we want to know about, okay? I'm going to go, keep going here because Cody's going to get upset if he doesn't have his <laughs> dinner at 7 o'clock. Um, <laughs> one of those other big picture videos that you'll see on the website in the big picture is this idea of be a manager. Now, if you follow last week, you know we're going to spend a whole day on this manager thing because it is such a crucial decision. That manager, every big band, Almost behind every big successful band was a big successful manager. Uh, so we'll talk about that in detail, what that looks like. The point of this little clip here as part of the big picture is that everybody's looking for a manager. Victor's looking for a manager. Every artist I've ever talked to is looking for a manager. Steve, would you be my manager? No. Okay. The reason I did this little clip is because until you find that manager, okay, Somebody in the band is going to be the manager, okay? Because all the stuff that needs to happen, even to get to the proverbial next level, is still there, right? So in the beginning, you're going to be the manager. So here's a couple big picture thoughts I'd give to the manager in the band. It doesn't have to be perfect. Perfect is not real. Playable is a more realistic goal, right? As I like to say for years, manageable. I'm not in the business of perfect. Perfect is in the dreams. I wake up and the dream's over. I'm in the real world and manageable 
is my goal. So I've set a realistic expectation. I would say that to anybody. Forget perfect. Forget that, well, everybody's pissed at me today. I said, well, they didn't shoot you, did they? They didn't fire you today, right? Well, then that's a win. Whoa. No, it's manageable. You can you live another day. That's cool. That's, that's a win. Trust me on that, right? Because if you're doing your job, somebody's going to think they hate you. Sammy, fair comment? Okay. Are they calling up and asking how you feel, Sam? Not a bit. But are they calling up to tell you how they feel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So would you find any perfect situations for that band seed list? Uh, no, not perfect. Even the ones that were perfect, somebody didn't think was perfect, right? It's very hard to get five Bang. artists to agree on anything. Any people, for that matter, okay? So playable. It's not perfect, it's playable. Here's something else I'll tell you. Everybody, particularly true in the music business, can identify all the things that I did wrong. Well, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have done that. There's a whole cottage industry of what I like to call professional problem identifiers in the world, right? They can tell you everything you're doing wrong. He's smiling, right? Um, there's a lot less people out there that are problem identifiers and problem solvers. The problem solvers are the ones that are moving the world and everybody else is just commentating, right? Now, by the way, if you just want to do your homework and be a commentator, that's okay. One of my good buddies is big time sports announcer, Al Michaels, who never played football, who never knocked heads with a 300 pound guy, but he's up to speed and he can commentate, it's a different thing. But if you're gonna be a manager and you're gonna be in the band and you're in charge of making something happen, right? then you gotta be a problem identifier, understand what the problem is, and then more importantly, you need to be a problem solver, because that's what managers do at the end of the day, okay? That's my advice here. If you wanna know more, folks, about the whole manager, instead of, will you be my manager, understand what they do, what the qualities and all that stuff, you'll come back uh, in a few weeks for the, the, uh, for the manager, okay. Another big picture concept, making it personal, right? This idea about making it personal and making people think you give a crap is important, whether you're in a restaurant business or your manager business, right? You go into a nice restaurant, the maitre d' knows your name, he knows your kid's birthday, they bring out the cake, you feel good about it, you come back, right? That's called making it personal. Lots of artists confuse making it personal, and some business people too, with, I'm not gonna grovel, I'm not going to sell myself. I don't have to handle these people. That's not handling. That's having good manners. That's being personal. And what it does today, and always has, is it builds value into the relationship. My friends in Incubus have benefited mightily by the personal touch they've shown in business and with their fans. And it has gotten them through thick and thin with their people uh, and their fans that have stuck with them th through thick and thin. And I think it's really important that you do that. So um, when I was a business person, every time I did a concert, and I, and, and, I, and I never knew whether I was going to get to do another one. I'd send a note to the agent, a note to the manager, and a note to the venue manager thanking them for working for me and looking forward to working with you again. And every time I wrote one of those notes, my fear, insecurity, and paranoia goes, well, shit, I don't know if I'm coming back. But I always acted like I was coming back. And so 36 years later, we're still sending those out. Now, maybe Joe writes them, maybe you know, Cody puts it in there and I scribble my signature on it, but the idea is there. We wanted to make it personal because it has value. It's also how you distinguish yourself from some of the other bands. Look at Kanye West. Do you guys think that Kanye West is making friends or losing friends today? Losing. I mean, it seems to be, it seems like he's doing both. Yeah. The, the people that are watching the train wreck aren't really friends. They're just people that they're looking, they, I don't want to look, I don't want to look, I got to look at this train wreck, right? That's right. My point is, is that he's, he's going off the deep end and it's going to cost him in the end. So take the time to make it personal, whatever business you're in, and it will help you. You know, another big picture idea, the best idea is your idea, right? I've, I think Sammy and I've had this conversation. When you're in the business of doing something great, right? Finding the right idea at the right time is the most important thing in the world, right? And it doesn't matter to the grizzly veterans whose idea it is. In fact, if you've been doing it as long as I have, you learn that everybody wants to take credit for the good idea, and everybody's gonna clear the room on the bad idea, no matter whose idea it is, right? So when you're in my position, or when you're smart about it, you sit there and think, I, here's where we are, here's where I need to be, I need to convince you to do something and you want to fight me, but you might listen to Victor or you might listen to Sam. So rather than you get in a fight, 
I go secretly to these guys and have you sell the ads. And then when you come walking into my office, you go, yo, Rennie, I've been thinking about this, man, and this is what I think we should do. The young buck says, well, that was my idea. They want the credit. The grizzly old veteran goes, dude, that is freaking awesome. Let's do that. And you walk out of the room. Point of the story is the best idea is your idea. Why? Because you'll do something about it. You'll be vested in the idea, right? And so the smart people spend time. If you're a musician in a band and you just want to tell the drummer, just play it like this, man, right? But with a little bit of time, you go out and have some lunch, buy him a beer. The producer goes, you go take a little leak. And the guy goes, hey, hey, Hose, you know, I really like the way you did I mean, on that other song. I really like the way you did that thing there. You know, do you think that would work? And now that guy's lost the fight for the other guy who might have bothered him about something. And all of a sudden, everybody comes back. And the drummer is going, okay, yeah, let's do it again. Instead of going, dude, that's what I was trying to tell you to do. You go, dude, God, we are so lucky to have this guy be our drummer. It takes a little time, takes a little effort, and it takes an acknowledgement that the best idea is your idea because you're going to do something about it. Don't get vested in whose idea. Understand the big picture, the right idea at the right time can change everything. Arguing about whose idea it was doesn't make any sense if you all have your name on the check at the end of the day, all right? Um, let's see, timing and lighting is everything. Here's one of my favorite ones of all time. And people ask me, what is timing and lighting? You say that all the time. Brandon Boyd used to kid me. He goes, Jesus Christ, Steve, you're always with this timing and lighting. And time. What does timing and lighting mean? Timing and lighting is about being prepared. Timing and lighting speaks to this idea that a great idea at the wrong time doesn't look like a great idea, okay? The you know, converse is true as well, right? If you have a crappy idea but just get the timing and lighting right, you happen to be in the right place when vanilla ice explodes and you, you're his manager for that day, you look like a genius. The truth is that it's probably neither one of those, right? And so it's all about being in the right place at the right time and the most important point is that you're prepared to make something happen. I have an old saying called the train to nowhere. Why does everybody want to book the train to nowhere? You know, they all got to get on that train. It's a band or it's a business guy that makes some decision in the moment and it's emotional and it makes no sense at all. And him making that decision at that particular point has no point. So it'd be like if the train to somewhere is coming into town, right? And, or the train to nowhere is leaving town. and the train to nowhere comes whenever it wants to come, the guy that's waiting at the station with his bags packed, just waiting for that train to somewhere, which they don't announce, they don't blow the whistle, it just goes up and the door's open and you just gotta know. If he's ready to go and you go, well, you know what? I gotta have my toothbrush. I gotta have my brush, I don't have my brush, I can't get on the train, right? That guy's getting on the train, buying his toothbrush at the next thing, you, Get, you miss the train, and, and the chance to get on the train that was going somewhere was there, but you're waiting all day long. You're always ready to get on the train to nowhere. The train to nowhere was chasing your toothbrush, okay? So that may seem wacky, but it's that whole idea of timing and lighting is about being prepared when your moment comes to deliver, that you're not thinking about it, you know? Um, that's what timing and lighting is about. Um, I'll use it in my own career here. The first 10 acts I managed right? Didn't have a win. So if the game was, Steve Rennie manages 10 bands, 0 for 10, this guy obviously can't manage. But if they gave you 11, on the 11th one, I look like a genius. I was the same guy for the first 10. Does that make sense? Timing and lighting. Timing and lighting. Would you really say you were the same person after managing those 10 bands when you found the 11th? Yes. More experienced at every turn, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I had the same mentality the whole time. I knew the same people. Of course, you learn a little bit more every time. And by the time I met Incubus, I had done a stint at a record company. But managing 10 bands, I'd done plenty of time at a record company. How do I know? I did so much time working at the record company that the guy who ran the record company reckoned it would be cheaper to hire me than have me sucking money out of the company for my bands, right? So I had plenty of company experience. I got some more valuable experience along the way that helped me. But I, I was the same guy. I was a well-respected manager for the first 10 and a big manager on the 11th. And neither one of them have to do with intellect necessarily. If you are your first band that you ever managed winds up being the biggest band in the world, for that moment, you're a big manager. 
But as I said about that YouTube wise guy, genius and commitment and, and whether you're really good isn't judged over 30 seconds. The, real, the longer test is could you sustain that over a period of time, okay? So when a guy like Peyton Manning at 38 years old has the best season in the history of the NFL at 38, lucky? No. Has he been lucky in his life? Yeah, he's been lucky. He's been unlucky. But overall, he was just good. OK, um, I'll give me another big picture thought in a business where winning it feels like winning in the lottery, where the chances are slim that you can't possibly succeed, where most records don't succeed commercially. Right. Uh, where most record label deals don't pound out and where millions of things can go wrong. People ask, well, how do you deal with all that failure? How do you deal with all that losing? Right. And the way you do it is by focusing on the wins. Right? Babe Ruth struck out more than he ever hit home runs. What do they remember him for? The home runs. The greatest A&R guys in the business, Andrew, how many wins do you think they had out of 20 bands they signed? Maybe a, a tenth. Less. Maybe a tenth. I'll give you a perfect example. A guy named Michael Goldstone, great A&R guy at Epic Records. Before that, he was a well-respected A&R who couldn't sign any bands that made any money. He goes to Epic Records, and in succession, he signed... Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine. How those work out? Okay. Timing and lighting. He got fired from two A&R gigs, was wounded, you know, bad, can't do it. couldn't do anything, and then had two big wins. After that, didn't have any other big wins. But my point is, you're remembered by the win. So when you're trying to figure out how to get through all this mentally, all the losing of the business, quote unquote, you do what great athletes do. You focus on the wins. You know, Kobe Bryant doesn't remember how many shots he missed. Jerry West didn't remember how many shots he missed. He was just going to keep shooting. And what fueled him was he was thinking about the wins. In his mind, he just, I'm supposed to win. Tiger Woods. He's just been winning since he was five years old. He thinks he's supposed to win. But in those moments where he's lost, he gets it out of his mind very quickly. And he focuses on the wins. He loves winning much more than he ever hated losing, Right. And so that's how the big boys and successful people deal with failure. It happens all the time. The, the good ones focus on the wins. And every band has a win. The great gig we played last night. And the next night when the PA sucks, Victor, and it's crappy and all that stuff, you know, if you focus on that, then you're going, you're pointing at your monitors and you're getting everybody all crazy instead of going, you know what, I know I'm good. I just proved it last night. I'll keep that image in my mind and I'll just make this happen, right? So that's a big picture thought, that focusing on the wins. That's how you stomach all the failure and the frustration of the business. You got to love winning more than you love losing. And if you've had some wins, and we all have them, okay, that's the picture you want in your mind. Not that I lost or got, I don't know. That, that, that won't serve you well. You got a question? Can I, can I just say something real quick? Sure. So um, this is just making me think of living in the past. And my buddy told me about a year ago um, when I was just going through like, you know, a bunch of stuff, whatever. Uh, he told me this quote, and I'll never forget it the first time he told me. He said, depression is living in the past, anxiety is living in the future, and happiness is in the present. But with the anxiety part, you know, looking at the big picture, it's kind of like a cool thing and, you know, exciting because you really have no idea what. It keeps you, it, it keeps you, it keeps you motivated. You know, it's, I think when you know, when you think you know the end of the game, when you know the answer to all the questions, I suppose on some level it provides some comfort. But I can speak to it in my own life. I just, you know, ended a 16-year relationship. Unbelievable ride that we had. But if I'm being honest, the first bit of it when we were building was much more fun for everybody, I think, than the maintaining and, and trying to re-inspire and all that stuff. And while I'm thankful for every moment, and, and the guys in Incubus are as well, for me, I'm looking forward to trying to build something again where the answer isn't clear. Today we start at zero. I said it last week. Today we're one getting started again, right? And so the, the excitement of not knowing what the answer is, is kind of what fuels me. So now I'm getting up in the morning, not worried about what, oh God, this or that. I'm now thinking, shit, we got to make some money. We got to find a way to pay. Well, I got to find a way to see if I can make some sense out of this. Not because I need to have a big score, but because I need a war to fight. This old warrior needs a war to fight. I need to go out there and be at risk a little bit. I need to go out there where the answers are unclear instead of totally clear. Because a guy like me and people that are trying to achieve, you people, Michelle, you need to have that fear of failure operating for you, okay? 
And, 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 and it, it's counterintuitive to a lot of people, but it's the mindset of winners. The winners are always looking to get into another battle. You know, you don't arrive in a day at success. It's like flying into Los Angeles. If any of you folks out there have flown into LA, you look out the windows, you're flying in for 40 minutes and you see lights on both sides of you. So by the time you actually land, you already know what you're gonna do in your car. And are you remember, God, was I parked on 3B or was I 4C? Geez, I can't remember where I parked, you know, all that stuff. You, by the time you get out, of, when I get off the plane, I'm already in my mind doing what I'm gonna do at home, right? So that's, that's the mindset. These are all the things we've talked about are big picture stuff. Any questions from you guys here? Michelle, any questions from, from the, the folks online? Yeah, we are have they a, still there? Did we, did we put them to there. sleep here? No, You're a still bold bunch, man. <laughs> um, we had a few questions that people wanted to ask you before class ends. We have, any advice for a 17-year-old dreaming about owning a record label? You've done the first part, you started young. Uh, do your homework, same thing they told you, your dad told, do your homework, and this homework isn't doing calculates, it's like figuring out what smart people do, figuring out what the successful people do, figure out what part of something I did, or this person did, or that person did, that you admire, that you think they did, or figure out what they're doing right, understand what the, what the winning players are doing, that's what you could do today. Understand that money wants an opinion. Understand that you'll need to raise it. Understand that artists may or may not agree with you, that they might hate you one day, love you the next. Those are all the things that will serve you well. But like Andrew, you'll, you'll be judged by whether you sign talent that sells enough records to make money. You can't pay the artists, you can't pay your employees, and you can't put any money in your own pocket. So business isn't an art discussion. Business isn't about whether that record's cool or not at the end of the day. If you're in business of music, it's about are you making money? Are you making decisions that put money in everybody's pocket? That's a successful business. If you just want to start a label to say I start a label, well, good, that's easy. You start, well, I can, we, let's start a record label today, you know? Done, okay? It's what you do and where you wanna go. So what's your target? It'll target, will lead you, it'll tell you what you're doing. But the best part is, start young because you're gonna need to have some practice and you're gonna need to take a few on your chin, buddy, and that's how you're gonna get smart. What else we got there? We got, how can we trust someone to be our manager and someone to work with? How do you choose the right person? It's confusing. Yes, what, I agree. How do you know? If you have a bunch of different managers, what would be the deciding factor? Well, we're going to talk about, first thing I would tell that person is make sure you show up when we're doing our session about your manager, right? Because it's not going to be about the who, it's going to be about what to look for. Well, this is what a great manager looks like, okay? These are the qualities they have. And once you understand that, then the who part gets a little easier. How do you trust someone? You build a relationship, but you can, if you guys ever trusted someone and been disappointed, everybody has, okay? But what did I tell you early? At a certain point, you make your best calculations, you do your thinking ahead of time, you pick your target, you do all of those things, and what did I say the glue was? Trust. And trust is gained over time, but that first date, you're going on faith in some sense of it. And some people have a better sense of it than others. But trust can be fleeting. But for the people that have done it right, they've managed to get it to happen. And the long relationships between managers and bands, no matter how they ended, was built on trust in track record, in, in delivering, and doing what you say. All that boring stuff that your parents talk about. It, there's nothing sexy about it. You know, people made commitments, they lived up to their commitments. I told you I was gonna do what I said and you told me you were gonna do what I said. That's how you build trust. Simple. It's not just something in the music biz. Any more questions than we're gonna get right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we could do, so I think this is a really good question. How do you maintain success after you make it? Toughest thing. It's actually, I think, you know, having been through it now, a, a couple times myself with a band and professionally in my own career, um, the, the, the toughest and the easiest part is the building. It's once you arrive at that destination that it starts to get tricky and it's because you need a new mission. You need a new war. That thing, if I can just do this, 
is the big lie because people that are achievers have a constant craving and need to be achieving. So they get to one place and they go, wow, okay, well now what am I gonna do? And that's why it's difficult, right? And that's why so many bands have a difficult time sustaining. Sports franchises have a difficult time sustaining. You go into the, to the Staples Center, you can see all these banners of the Lakers of how many times they've won championships, but tonight they absolutely suck. So if I was given a fucking speech to those guys, I'd say, I want you to walk out of here today, gentlemen, look at every one of those banners up on that wall. We know how to win. We've forgotten it, we'll figure it out, but we know how to win. Let's do this, right? And it'll either happen or it won't. They'll change the chemistry, they'll fire the coach, they'll get rid of a player. They change the mix. That's how you try to sustain. You got to keep mixing it up, right? So anyway, and that's the last one for today? Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for, for participating online. It's been a lot of fun. Next week, we're going to talk about this whole idea, again, kind of a big picture thing, of treating your career as a business. We're going to distinguish between career and hobby. We're going to get you to look at your music career just like a consumer product company would look at a business. And while it might be a little uncomfortable for some of you artists, I think that exercise will actually serve you well. Uh, and uh, oh, actually, you know what? I got that wrong. We're going to be talking about building your professional team. Excuse me, I skipped ahead a week. We talk about it all the time. If you're doing something big in your life, it's probably bigger than one person and you're going to need some help. And so picking your professional team will help you avoid making that video that we saw from Flo and Eddie there today. So, in conclusion, talent and desire was not enough to guarantee success. It's all about the decisions you make after that music has been made. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. And while there are some things that you can control, most of the stuff in the music business winds up being out of your control. Your attitude is the one thing that you can control. You can decide what kind of attitude you bring to the party every day. And I'm saying to you that if you got your head on straight and you're looking to do something great in the music business, having your head screwed on tight is step one. And I hope we gave you a little bit of insight into today. So we'll see you back here next Wednesday where we talk about building a professional. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank you four guys for being here. Michelle for taking good care of us. Matt Rennie on the camera, Cody Ramis, Joe Lilac, Darren Legro, and Cody, new Cody on the other camera. <laughs> Thanks for having us. We'll see you next week.